it's my pleasure to introduce Richard, who is going to tell us about Scala Native, right? And uh, it's funny, I was sharing an office with Dennis back at my EPFL days, around the time he started, he started Scala Native. So I was more in the loop of what was going on earlier on. But who better to tell us about the more recent developments than Richard, who literally wrote the book about it, as I understand, right? I'm sure you're going to, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're I, going to I, refer I'll... to that. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you for um, the shameless plug. I appreciate it. And, uh, and uh, I think we're collecting questions, but you're probably going to take questions towards the end or in the, in the Q&A room. Yes, that's the plan. OK, uh, yeah, take it away. I'm excited. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's get this started. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming to my talk, uh, Where Scala Native Fits. Um, so what this talk is about is about these sort of two personalities that Scala Native has. There's, there's an aspect of it um, that's focused on JVM interop and sort of getting to parity with uh, traditional Scala. Um, and then there's this other personality that's centered around C interop um, and, and very, very low level programming. Um, and what I'm hoping this talk does is it draws out both how those two parts relate to each other, but also how they relate to two broader ecosystems. On the JVM side, how it relates to classic Scala, to Scala JS, and to GraalVM. And on the C side, how it relates to things like Rust and Go and OCaml. And then if there's time, I can maybe go a little further afield than that. And then from sort of these two overviews, um, and this is going to be a fast-paced talk, um, hopefully we'll be able to get a more contextualized sense of where Scala Native fits in um, to all of this. Um, so who am I to be talking about this? I'm a, I'm a data engineer at M1 Finance in Chicago. Um, I can't give the whole spiel, but we're a fast growing FinTech startup in Chicago. Our entire backend is a asynchronous uh, Scala microservices. Would love to geek out with anyone about that if they're interested. Um, off, offline. Um, I'm a, I was a pretty early Scala native contributor, more really on the, um, the, the POSIX interop side than on the, the, the real core. I'm not a compiler engineer um, by training. Um, I am the author of uh, several Scala native libraries that I'll, I'll talk about um, uh, later. Probably the most prominent one is Scala native loop, um, our libuv event loop binding. And then I'm the author of this book about Scala Native, uh, Modern Systems Programming with Scala Native. Uh, you can get the physical book on Amazon. You can get a DRM free ebook for my fabulous publishers, um, Pragmatic. Um, just Google Scala Native book and you'll find it. Um, so some caveats about this talk. Um, if you've seen me talk about Scala Native before, <laughs> I usually have a lot of code and go really fast and get into really deep detail. This one is different. This is more high level and I'm talking about other, 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 other technologies. Um, and every time I've spoken about Scala Native, people ask me these things, and they're always really interesting conversations. But I, I've been hesitant to really go on the record with this. Um, so I, I, I really want to um, delimit that I'm not speaking for Scala Native as a project at all. Um, I'm not speaking for my employer. There are a lot of spicy takes in this talk that are wholly my own. And also, to be clear, nothing in this talk is a versus. I'm not disparaging anything. If I'm talking about something, something else in this talk, it's because I like it and think it's cool. Um, it's also entirely likely that I'll get something wrong, or, and I'm certain I'll say things that other people disagree with. And I would love to dig into that in the Q&A um, and breakout. Um, all of those disclaimers aside, though, there's a lot of content, so let's get started. So to start, Scala Native. It's a plugin for Scala C. It provides ahead of time compilation for idiomatic Scala and outputs um, binary compact executables, five to 10 megabytes, um, similar to what a C compiler um, spits out or, or, or a Rust compiler or Go compiler. Um, it also provides an ergonomic unsafe DSL um, with low level capabilities. And we'll go really deep into that in the second half of the talk. Um, the catch with this is that it doesn't include the Java standard library for free like, like traditional Scala does because it's not running on a JVM. Um, and the, the problem that, that Scala.js really had to solve before, before Scala Native did is what Scala without Java like means conceptually because so much of the early appeal um, 
of Scala was its compatibility with Java, right? And there's, there's really three different aspects to, to Scala's dependency on Java. There's core Scala features that are implemented by Java capabilities, um, things like, you know, string and, and, and byte, right? Um, but also more um, arcane classes like, like Java's URL implementation uh, basically requires a full network stack. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot of depth to, to the Java standard lib. Um, but then beyond that, there's also Scala code that depends on Java library code, you know, a Scala um, library like, uh, um, uh, like that, that provides database access, like Slick will depend on JDBC under the hood, right? Um, so you have to think about that in terms of not providing Java capabilities. And then finally, in the application layer, you can have Scala code within and linking to a larger Java application. Um, which I think is moving more and more out of favor. I think that was part of the initial Scala as a better Java pitch, but maybe the community is moving away and I don't really hear about that pattern as much anymore. All, all of which is to say that these are sort of three different aspects of Scala and Java working together um, and that we can sort of treat treat differently for the purposes of, of, of getting Scala native um, ready for prime time, right? Um, so in following um, Scala.js uh, and in fact, borrowing a lot of the code from Scala.js, what Scala Native does is it has a, a module called Java Lib, which is re-implementations of the Java standard library uh, in Scala. Um, and there, in particular, there's there's a bunch of IP uh, restrictions on this, so you know you can't even look at any um, any at any Java or Oracle or Sun IP to do this. But there are also things like Apache Harmony that have gone before and Scala JS that have gone before that we can borrow from. Um, but it's still a, a, a really um, impressive um, and, and huge um, undertaking. Um, so, and, and, and again, because Scala.js is a few years ahead of us, we've actually been able to borrow a, a, a really good amount of this code. Um, unlike, how, unlike Scala.js, I would say the, uh, the, the native platform is a lot less portable um, than, uh, the, 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 than, than JavaScript, right? Uh, than, than Node or the browser. Uh, the native platform has fewer built-in capabilities, but I think in, in some sense fewer, fewer limits. Anything your operating system can do, uh, Scala native can do. Um, and maybe another way of thinking of that is that um, Scala.js is re-implementing the, the Java lib on top of JavaScript and Scala native is re-implementing the Java lib um, on top of POSIX. Um, but the then the question is, well, well, how much of that coverage do we need? Um, and for, for Scala native, what I'd say is that um, obviously you wanna support as much of the Java standard library as possible. Um, supporting the Scala language itself is, is mandatory. Um, but there, there, there are edge cases um, around things like reflection, around runtime class loading that are a challenge. Um, large, complex Java libraries like Netty um, can be problematic. And this actually creates real problems for some of the like really popular older um, Scala libraries like Akka and Spark um, that, that depend on reflection or class loading um, uh, or, or other quirkier um, JVM internals um, in a deep fashion. Um, so we, we, we want to think about sort of what, what we can do either to work around that um, or, or alternatives to those approaches, um, I think is how I put it. Um, the, the other player in this space that, that's sort of really relevant here and that, we ask, and, and that we get asked about a lot in terms of comparisons, right, is, um, is Grawl, uh, Oracle's um, next generation um, JVM research project. Um, and, and they, so to be really clear, I think this is a great project. I know a lot of people working on it. I've read most of their research papers and I'm a, I'm a big geek for programming language theory. Um, they're, they're making both theoretical uh, breakthroughs as well as, as practical ones. But, but we should be really clear that there, there's really two some, somewhat separate projects uh, when people talk about Grawl. Um, the the Graal VM JIT, the, the just-in-time compiler, is, is state-of-the-art for supporting dynamic languages and functional languages on the JVM. And when people talk about using Graal in production at Twitter, they're talking about the JIT, um, right? Um, whereas the, the substrate VM, the, the, the Graal native image uh, that outputs small compact binaries, that's an ahead-of-time compiler and a lightweight runtime for JVM bytecode. Um, it, because it's a small lightweight runtime, there's no, there's no just-in-time compiler included in that. Um, so though it does output compact bytecode, um, it doesn't have access to the level of optimization that a, that a JIT does. Um, these, and they're both really, really cool projects. Um, and they're, they're both very useful. 
Um, but there are actually, but, but, but they're, they're, they, they are distinct. Um, and then in particular, um, I think the, the divide between these two is fundamental because they both work on Java bytecode, um, not on Scala code. Uh, that is to say, Graal native image uh, can take the output of Scala C and, and, and compile it, um, but it never sees uh, Scala syntax uh, trees. Um, whereas in contrast, Scala native actually has fundamental advantages over Graal because it's plugged in earlier in the pipeline. It's a Scala C plugin that never outputs um, JVM bytecodes at all. Um, and as a result, Scala natives ahead of time compiler and optimizer can produce uh, both performance that is competitive with Graal VM's JIT uh, while still producing a compact native binary um, like, like, like native image. Um, and I don't, I don't think I've seen uh, super recent head-to-head uh, -head performance uh, numbers, but Dennis was, was running them all through the, 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 the development of the, of the optimizer and, and keeping parity uh, with, with Graal and, and Hotspot, I know was a, a core goal. Um, all that being said, uh, Graal has fundamental strengths because it is a JVM, has Oracle IP, et cetera, at JVM platform coverage and features. Uh, they don't have to put resources into re-implementing JavaLib. They just get it. Um, and in particular, they've been able to demonstrate things like Netty and Akka uh, running, for example. Um, surprisingly, uh, Graal seems to struggle with um, unsafe memory usage. Um, because, again, because it is a JVM and it's committed to the, the old sun.misc.unsafe APIs, which don't have exactly C-style semantics. Um, and, and then, in again, because it's, it's not a, a Scala project per se, it also can't provide a, an ergonomic DSL for, for working with, with unsafe memory. And I think the, the sort of meta argument I'm going to make in this talk is that unsafe, the unsafe memory is never safe, but the ergonomics determine sort of how safe it is. And, and the advantages Scala native gives at making um, unsafe code readable really do make a difference. Um, so maybe with that, uh, we can sort of shift gears and, and talk about Scala Native's um, unsafe capabilities and really about this, this other side of the house, this C interop um, and POSIX interop that we have that we're using to, to implement um, the, the Java lib, right? Um, but, but also what else can we, it can do? Because we can go a lot, a lot farther beyond what, what Java provides um, in some ways. Um, in particular, the thing I want to call out is that you know, older, older libraries like Akka and, and Spark aside, a lot of newer Scala libraries don't have JVM dependencies. And I think there's a, a movement away from that, that ideologically um, in the, the open source community. And that it's actually possible for Scala native to, to basically skip the JVM entirely and provide our ports um, or our, our, um, our targets for, for um, you know, popular contemporary Scala libraries like Zio and STP and um, Howie's uh, giant ecosystem, um, not in terms of JVM capabilities, but in terms of um, uh, Zio was um, on top of LibUV, uh, the, the, the internal Node.js C library for event looping. STDP was on top of libcurl, um, a, a fabulous C library for, for anything request oriented. Um, and Howie's stuff is um, entirely on top of POSIX. Um, and I think as the community moves away from Javaism and more towards pure Scala, um, I think this, this approach is going to win and continue to pay dividends. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm also, after watching that last talk of Michael's, I'm also slightly embarrassed we don't have Skodek for, uh, for Scala native. That one's very high on my, uh, my list to port in the very near future. Um, but so let's, let's keep going deeper though, because I don't want this talk to be totally me um, blowing hot air and waving my hands. Um, let's, let's talk about the actual Scala native .unsafe API, what it does, what it looks like, and, and how the, what, what's going on behind the curtains. Um, basically, the unsafe API provides the fundamental capabilities that C provides. Um, primitive values, you know, ints, um, bytes, longs, floats, um, pointers, arrays, structs, and, and C style functions, um, which is to say static functions. Um, and these are all things that are traditionally taught in C and like in a systems programming course. And they're not always directly exposed at the raw level in, in higher level um, languages. Uh, right, but sort of this is my first real hot take is that 
um, these aren't just C-isms, um, or even like aspects of the C abstract machine, um, like some people have been arguing recently, that these are, are fundamental information structures for programming at, a, at, a, at the lowest level that, that you get from Knuth or from like von Neumann's papers. Um, and that it's entirely possible to do a better job um, than C does at exposing these structures and working with them. Um, and, and again, this is, this is something we can definitely dispute, but let's, uh, that, that's at least what I'm gonna try to argue for, for the rest of this talk, uh, so to speak. Um, so uh, the, the core of this is really Scala Native's pointer type, um, which is just a nice parameterized generic type. It's a 64-bit integer under the hood that denotes the address of a value somewhere in memory, right? Um, you create it with explicit allocation, stack alloc here, and then you both uh, read, you, you can both store values into a pointer, um, that is into the memory location indicated by the address, or um, load or read values out of that address with the, the dereference operator, the, the exclamation mark. Uh, so that's what we're doing on line four. Um, we're reading um, the pointer, and on uh, line seven, we're, we're setting it, basically. Um, kind of the cool thing is we don't have an address of operator, um, and instead all stack and keep allocation um, for unmanaged objects is explicit. We also have a really nice zone allocator, um, but, and that prevents you from doing things like uh, breaking the seal and getting the address of something the garbage collector might steal from you. It also makes, so there, it means there's a really clean boundary and a, a typed boundary between safe and unsafe code, which I think is a, actually a big um, ergonomic benefit we have over, over Go, which I'll come out to. Um, also, if you're a, like a Haskar SML person, um, uh, it's very close to the semantics of, SM, of the, the ML ref or, or Haskell has, a, has an internal pointer type um, that, that behaves similarly. Um, the, the one thing that's a little more C-like is that pointers also are arrays, that it can be a container for zero or more values in contiguous uh, storage. And because the, the size of each value um, in that chunk of memory is known, um, that you can compute the offset um, statically, right, in, in constant time, um, which is a, a better performance characteristic for, for a random seek than just about any higher level um, uh, data structure will give you, and a reason why it can be really useful, um, albeit a pain uh, to work with low-level data structures like this. Um, if you look at my Scala days talk from um, two years ago, I go really, really deep into exactly how this can perform better than traditional um, higher-level data structures for certain kinds of tasks, but I won't go super deep there. Instead, I'll, I'll just shift to the takeaways for this, because this is a shorter talk. Um, what the, this unsafe API gives us is it gives us C-level performance for working with these contiguous data structures. It gives us a clean model for interfacing safe code with unsafe code. Um, it gives us syntax that's much easier to write correctly um, than C. Um, like when I was writing the libuv bindings, I wrote a lot of them correct, right the first time, which certainly never happened when I was a working C programmer. Um, and then um, the explicit model of mutability, right, because a, a pointer does represent the capability to mutate a thing, um, is actually kind of nice and something that, like the fact that Scala doesn't have a type level distinction from var and val seems kind of weird. So I, I actually like um, explicitly modeling mutable cells. Um, and then it gives you access to any C libraries and there are great C libraries for, for everything under the sun. And then on top of all this unsafe stuff, you get all of the just core Scala native features. You have a state-of-the-art garbage collector, you have all of our functional programming capabilities, pattern matching, errors, exceptions, mutable data structures, um, et cetera. So I'm looking at the time. I don't think I'm gonna stop for questions. I think I'm just gonna keep pushing ahead um, and then take questions at the end if that's okay. Um, so this is, the, this is where we start to go further afield though, because we've talked about both Scala native's high-level capabilities and it's low level capabilities. And now we can talk about some of the, these other um, players in the ecosystem, especially in this, this low level domain. Um, and the ones I wanna talk about are Rust, Go, and OCaml. And again, this isn't a fight. I like all of these. I think they're all useful. Um, and it's about um, understanding where they complement each other based on their differences, not saying one is better than the other. Um, so Rust, right, um, is a fabulous um, youngish, a uh, compiled language that performs roughly like C or C++. Um, it has me memory safety uh, without a garbage collector by introducing um, a sort of quirky uh, discipline of explicitly annotating ownership of values and references. Um, 
uh, which can be somewhat intrusive, but is also really powerful. Um, it doesn't have higher kind of types, uh, but if you're, if you're not a purist about functional programming, it does have a very, very nice type system and macros um, that, that largely make up for it, if you don't mind not having monads, for example. Um, and then it has actually quite good capabilities for C interop, but the Rust community seems to really discourage that more and more. And Rust has an unsafe API, but it, it, it really seems like the, the Rust community is moving away from it. Um, and I think this is, this is really exciting um, in that they're really trying to, to sort of uh, to dispute my point that the C model is fundamental in general. Um, whereas I think my counterpoint is, is this, that although they're, 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 they're trying to show that uh, this, this ownership model can, can, can replace C in every um, domain, um, I don't think that's, they, they've accomplished that yet, although they continue to make extraordinary strides every year. Um, the big things I'd be looking to see in the next few years are whether, you know, someone writes a really good operating system in Rust that's, that, that's usable, whether Rust turns out to be good for implementing other higher level languages, um, or whether it's more of a walled garden. Um, that being said, with the Rust community moving away from unsafe Rust, I think that means Scala Native really has advantages both at a, at a lower level than Rust provides, at working with pointers, arrays, bit flipping, et cetera, um, and then providing a very high level um, on top of that, because we do have you know, monads, functional programming, garbage collection, immutable data structures in, in Scala Native. And when I've worked in Rust, I find that those are things I miss. And that, I mean, just working with mutable sequences all the time um, is awkward for me. I think immutable sequences feel right um, uh, to me uh, after 10 years of writing Scala, for better or for worse. Um, something that might actually be a little closer than Rust to where Scala Native fits is actually Go, which is a garbage collected compiled language. It has a state of the art uh, concurrent runtime, what they call Go routines, closely related to CSP. And then the, the funny thing about it is it has these, these built in um, uh, uh, collection types, slice and map, and then a built in concurrency primitive, channels. Um, but it doesn't actually have generics for user provided code and you can't subclass or extend those built in collections. Um, with not, not having generics again is hard for me. I'm, I'm a Scala developer. Uh, it's hard for me to think about how to model problems without that. Um, that said, Go has been incredibly strong in distributed systems. That's where I use it. Um, if I'm working with Kubernetes or something like that. Um, C interop is available in Go, but it's actually really problematic just because once you call out to C, um, you basically have to, to freeze a lot of the concurrent runtimes, um, M onto N threading um, me mechanisms. And then just by design, Go isn't really meant for FP. It does, I think, it does have like lexical scope um, and closures, um, but it, that, that it's, that's not it, what it's intended for um, and not really where it's going. Um, that being said, it's an amazing and effective language that I like using when I'm working in a domain that's well aligned with the, the, the abstractions it provides. Um, but it seems to really not be, um, be, extend, be easily extendable by libraries to, to new domains in the, the same way that, that Scala has had so much strength and success with for, for decades now. And then it actually doesn't go all the way down uh, to the lowest possible level. It, it still has a, a garbage collected feel. Um, even if it sort of looks like C, um, it, it's, I think it's fundamentally more abstract. Um, closer still to Scala Native, and my favorite of these three is actually OCaml, um, which is um, if, you know, I think not as many people have used it, especially in the industry, right? But it's a, you know, it's a typed, um, strictly evaluated functional programming language, closely related to, to standard ML, um, Henley Milner-ish uh, type system with some, some augmentations, an excellent object system also. So it's a, it's a multi-paradigm language like Scala, great performance, a great uh, bump garbage collector. Um, it can compile to native binaries, it can compile to JavaScript. It has, um, one thing it has that Scala native does not it is it has a really great unikernel target, uh, Mirage OS. Um, I would love to get uh, <laughs> a Scala native unikernels going. Um, it's very strong at C interop and FFI. Again, our, our pointer type is very similar to their ref. And if you don't like the ML syntax, Facebook has an alternative front end called Reason ML, which is more conventional Algol type scripty um, syntax. I mean, I mean, I could keep going. I think OCaml is great. And, you know, I, I sort of, I, I, I treat Scala <laughs> like standard ML too often. Um, but, you know, 
all that being said, Scala Native has very similar strengths to, to OCaml, but the Scala community is actually larger and there's a lot more um, and more mature libraries available. Um, even though I, yeah, I think we're, I think actually I think OCaml and Scala are about the same age. Subjectively though, I would say Scala for me, who, who, who knows both languages pretty well, Scala is more productive um, and, and more approachable. Um, all of that being said, though, it's um, OCaml is great, and if you haven't um, checked it out, you you probably should. Um, I will be sticking with Scala Native, uh, <laughs> though. Um, so then, the having finished the the sort of survey parts of this, um, and having five minutes left um, on the clock, uh, so um, I, I'm betting a lot of y'all saw this. Uh, Howie posted this epic um, blog post, the death of hype and what's next for Scala. And uh, in some ways he took a little wind out of my sails because I think he had a, he made a great case for Scala Native's impact and a list of specific areas where it's, where it's strong. Um, any place memory, um, memory where you have limited memory constraints um, or where startup time counts like CLI apps, sidecars, proxies, mobile, um, but also things like desktop or C interop where and anywhere you need to work closely with a C library or an operating system. And I think uh, the rest of the talk um, of this talk has sort of, I think, backed most of that, uh, most of that up. I think it can show why we're, we're really competitive in those spaces. Um, what I want to do is actually sort of spin this and put some more like more speculative and experimental things where Scala native could, um, could potentially kick butt. Uh, part of my French, uh, but would probably require more strategic investment, um, but could also be really um, high impact and exciting. Um, so serverless is the first, um, you know, this, this, um, it's in some ways, it's more of a billing model um, for cloud computing than a technology. But the idea of creating new processes or virtual machines on demand to serve individual requests, um, which can be very cost effective, but it's also very sensitive to startup to startup time, memory usage, binary size, etc. Um, Scala Native is almost perfect for serverless, um, and I've actually already built an AWS Lambda custom runtime. Um, it's open source. It's on GitHub here. Um, I won't dwell on this, but honestly, I think um, serverless execution models are the future of sort of bread and butter, crud, stateless um, backend programming. Um, if you don't have complicated con consensus or distributed systems or persistence needs, and I think Scala Native is going to be very, very strong here um, as this as this domain continues to to grow. Um, well, another one that's actually really close to my heart is embedded programming, and you think of this as being these tiny Arduinos that are about as powerful as a pocket watch, but embedded processors have gotten really fast. The new um, the STM thirty two H sevens that run in the new Arduino Portenta, which comes out next month. That's a dual core 480 megahertz ARM processor with really nice DSP capabilities. And people are running dynamic languages on these things. They're running Lua, they're running Python, they're running JavaScript. Um, this is a completely different beast from, from what we've thought embedded programming and microcontrollers were. Um, and of course, when you're working in this space, you're working very close to the hardware. So having vendor support is, is important and also challenging, um, but they're, there are ways to solve this problem. Um, Shadaj actually has a pretty amazing 32-bit branch of Scala Native um, that targets ARM that he was using for a, a robotics uh, competition in high school, I think. It's really phenomenal work. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited that we've demonstrated this is a, a possibility. Um, and again, I think Scala Native could, again, be phenomenal here. We're really good at the lowest possible level of low-level programming, and, that, that, and Embedded is exactly the kind of place uh, where this matters. Um, another one that's surprisingly similar to embedded is WebAssembly. Um, so LLVM, the, the compiler backend Scala Native uses, um, already includes WebAssembly uh, as a target. So we're a lot of the way there. The difference is it's, uh, it's a 32-bit target. Um, and as a result, Shadaj's uh, fork of Scala Native um, has also been demonstrated to output WebAssembly. Um, so we, we, we've shown this is a thing and, um, Hannes Roots actually has, sh has actually compiled, uh, like web audio units, um, and run web assembly in a browser from Scala native, uh, which I think is just, uh, again, it's one of these really awesome new domains where Scala doesn't have coverage, um, at all. Um, I think it's an, an open question how this relates to Scala JS, um, in the browser, right? And what, what, how the, cause I think how we overlap these two spheres. 
Um, and, and Seb has a great talk about Scala.js and WebAssembly uh, from Scala Days last year that I, I rewatched and I would recommend all of y'all y'all do if you're, you're thinking about um, sort of how these play together. Um, my other hot take though on this is to the extent that WebAssembly conquers the world and becomes a general purpose runtime, I think it does demonstrate that the C von Neumann linear memory model uh, that the Rust people are, have, <laughs> are trying to, to make a break with is in fact general. <laughs> and even if Rust is a strong player in WebAssembly, it's because they're targeting um, a, a, a profoundly abstracted uh, random access uh, machine. So I'm I'm excited to see where this goes. Also, um, and again, I think it's it's This might I think this is probably a lot cl closer uh, to our re to our grasp than even than embedded is, just because it's um it's already supported um for for so many um uh by, by LVM. Um, so the the last one, and I think I'll I'll skim over these because I'm officially at time. But there's two new classes of hardware peripherals. There's there's non volatile memory. Uh, you know, byte addressable storage. It's about 10 times the, the speed of, of, of flash. Um, a lot of times you just mount it into memory. Um, and then you also have these high speed 10 gigabits and up um, network cards, right, which run much, much faster than, than the Linux kernel can. And in both cases, you'll, you'll end up in situations where um, traditional models for working with networking and storage um, kind of break. Uh, but if you're you're willing to accept the fact that your your memory models and object ownership models have broken, you have the capability to, to write systems that are behave really qualitative di qualitatively differently from what we've built for the last 20 years of the cloud era. You know, I mean, I, I think we've all taken for granted that the best we can get for cloud services is low millisecond response times between between hosts. And with new network interfaces on good ethernet connections, you can get single digit microsecond response times. Um, and we're at the entire research community is still figuring out what exactly we do with these devices. Um, but whatever it does, I think breaks both garbage collection and Rust's ownership model. And I think a lot of what we've assumed. Um, but at the same time, I think that Scala Native's capability to build new abstractions on top of plain byte addressed memory um, sort of positions us ideally um, to adapt to this. And I think it's, it's this space more than anything else where Scala Native could build something genuinely new and groundbreaking, something that blows people's minds the way, the way Spark did um, a decade ago. Um, and that's maybe what I get most excited about uh, when I think about Scala Native's future. Um, and with that, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you so much. This, uh, this has been great and I'm right on time. <laughs>